Hello and welcome to section two of personality psychology or theories of personality. Once again, my name is uh, Professor Bradley Mitchell and I will be leading the discussion today. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, personality research methods. And for those of you who have uh, taken psychology courses before, um, so anybody who is enrolled in Psych 209 or any 200 level course will have taken 101, obviously. This is going to be a review. And if you've taken multiple, if you've taken maybe abnormal or lifespan or drugs and behavior or human sexuality, uh, again, a lot of this is going to be review, but we're going to be putting it into the context of personality psychology. So while the major types of research are not going to change, this will be a review for you. Uh, the, the way in which we uh, focus our research is going to be slightly different. So let's go ahead and get started. And we'll go over the objectives of this lecture. Uh, we're going to look at uh, the four ways to look at psychology, uh, personality psychology. So behavior, life, informants, self. Those are the, uh, the bliss ways of looking at personality. We're going to look at the advantages and disadvantages of data and each type of data. We're going to talk about the ways that we can collect data and look at the basic issues of data quality, which is the fundamental um, component of quality research, which is what we want uh, so that this, uh, this study remains a science. Not only, uh, as we talked about last time, it's an art and a science, but we want this to be scientific in the way that we look at things. So when we look at the soft sciences, and psychology um, is one of the major soft sciences along with sociology um, and uh, 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 to lesser degrees, um, economics and criminal justice and uh, human services, things of that nature. The emphasis is on thinking and seeking new knowledge. So we know we have this basic understanding of what we know today. And this is what we call um, the things that we have hypothesized and we've shown to be um, theoretically valid. So we have this uh, platform that we stand on, which is the knowledge that we currently possess or the things that we think we know. And so research is always looking to either correct an incorrect theory, um, expound on a theory, or in, in some you know very revolutionary cases, actually create new theories. Um, and, and what we're doing is we're exploring the unknown. Uh, we're not asking questions that we already think we know the answer to. Um, it may feel like that in undergraduate psychology because you're really just learning those theories that you've that people have already learned. And this is where a lot of students try to get, uh, you know, the, the cart in front of the horse. They want to look at things that are unknown. They want to explore the metaphysical. They want to look at pseudo psychology before they have a good grasp of psychological principles. You can't know what you don't know until you know what you know. And so you have to have this really basic understanding before you can look into the, the really in-depth um, aspects of psychology. And so what research is, is exploring the unknown. And so, uh, you know, you don't really get into research in your undergraduate program, uh, even you know a good chunk of a master's program, you're not really getting into uh, research. You're studying research that's already been done because one of the most you know blatant wastes of time is to do research on something and find out, well, this has already been done. Um, and it's already been done to uh, a degree where it's been peer reviewed and uh, it's accepted whether something is not uh, a good theory or whether it is a good theory. Um, what we want to do in research is know what has already been accepted either challenge it, which is still a valid thing to do in research, is to take something that people believe and challenge it in a new way that hasn't been tested before, or take it, take that knowledge that we have and grow it in some way that's beneficial for everybody. So when we look at the these clues to personality, um, we get back to that term, the psychological triad, thoughts, feelings, and behavior. Um, these are the things that psychology is all about. Thoughts being your cognitions, feelings being your emotions, behavior being the manifestation of thoughts and feelings, how you act on the outside. And remember, this is a triad. It's a triangle, which means that if you take any two, it's going to, it's going to influence the third. Okay. So if I have a 
thought and I behave in a certain way, it's going to cause me to feel something. If I feel and behave something, it's going to change the way that I think. Um, and, and this can, you know, when we get into cognitive theories, um, the way that you feel about something and the way that you behave will often uh, change the way that you fundamentally think about something. Uh, and this is why cognitive behavioral therapy, getting a little bit ahead of, of ourselves and getting outside of the scope of personality, but um, you know, if you think and behave a certain way, it'll sometimes help your feelings. Uh, and so cognitive behavioral therapy has this notion of act as if. So somebody who has depression, if you tell them, hey, if you just act as if you're happy, what would you do? How would you behave? And force a smile on your face, force yourself to think happy thoughts, uh, you know, that feeling, you're not really going to have genuine cognitions, but eventually your thoughts will start to go into line. And so that's what cognitive behavioral therapy is all about. So that's that triad. Keep always remember thoughts, feelings, behaviors. Um, there are no perfect indicators of personality. Okay. Um, find a psychologist who believes that they can, uh, you know, find the perfect, um, uh, tests that will tell me exactly what a person will do in the future. And I will show you somebody who is trying to sell you something. Um, th there's a very interesting um, book that came out recently. Uh, and I'm going to on the fly here, um, try to find that. Okay, so I paused my lecture just for a second so I could find this. Um, it is Michael Lewis, The Undoing Project. I'm going to see if I can show you here. Um, this recently came out. It's on the bestseller list right now. Um, it, uh, it really looks at some of these psychological principles from a uh, historical perspective. But one of the really interesting um, stories within this is um, they're looking at uh, how you can take uh, data and try to apply it in such a way that you can predict how people are going to behave in a certain situation. Um, they talk about if you've seen the film or heard the story of Moneyball, where um, in, the, in the, I think the 80s or 90s, there were people who came together and tried to make uh, baseball teams uh, come together using almost economic principles rather than, you know, using coaches who say this player is good, this player isn't. And one of the things that the individuals do is uh, in this story is they try to figure out who to draft in professional teams. And they, they tell an anecdote of um, every year they would bring in a psychologist who would say they have the perfect way to make an assessment to figure out whether or not a person is going to be a quality player, a good teammate, whether they're going to blow through their money and, and get into trouble. And every year they found out, you know, all these psychologists were basically just feeding them a bill of goods. That's not to say that they're, they weren't giving valuable information, but to say that there's a personality uh, assessment out there that can tell me whether or not a person's going to do well in school, whether they're going to uh, be a good employee, whether they're going to be a faithful um, companion, there isn't one out there. But the information can help guide in decisions. Uh, and this is kind of the something beats nothing. Um, if, if I were to, uh, I, one of my backgrounds is in industrial organizational psychology, and I used to work and consult with human resource departments in recruiting and retention and trying to find people for certain positions. And I would give um, uh, personality assessments like the Myers-Briggs or um, the 16PF or something of that nature. And I would always present the findings with the, the indications from this assessment is that these are the traits that this person has. Now, be mindful. You know, they may have been trying to make a good impression. They may have been answering the questions as if they were the person that would be ideal for this job. We don't know exactly. Um, I, I'm pretty confident with my assessment, but I'm not telling you that these traits are perfect or these traits are 100% um, accurate because there's no way for me to know that. I'm, I, I, there are components within the assessment that is going to try to figure that out. And by doing behavioral observations, we can sometimes pick out those things, but uh, nothing is perfect, but something always beats nothing. So we're going to look at something called S data. And S data is a self reporter self, uh, self judgment. Uh, and, it, and it's it's a rather subjective measure. Uh, this is when we're giving out questionnaires or surveys. S data is things that people will self-report. Um, high face solidity, which means that on the surface, the information that a person is going to give is going to be valid. Okay, so let's back up and 
remember some of the terms from Psych 101 and other science courses. We have the terms validity and reliability. Validity is whether or not the information or the data that we're getting matches what uh, we're trying to ask, what question we're asking. And reliability is if I ask this question over and over, will I get the same response? So in 101, I use the example of if I were to give my final exam in Psych 101, and that final exam was uh, to go outside and shoot 100 basketball free throws and come in, tell me how many you made out of 100, and that would be your final grade for Psych 101, okay? Now, for the most part, would that test be reliable? Yes, it would be reliable because most people are going to make about the same amount of free throws every time. If you're not a skilled basketball player, uh, if you've never played before, you might make five out of 100. And every time you, if I send you out once a week to do that with no practice, you'll probably make about five out of 100. If you're an NBA caliber uh, point guard, I would expect for you to come in and say, uh, I made about 94. And every time you go out and shoot 100, you make about 94. It's reliable because every time I give you that test, it's going to be the same. But is it valid? No. Shooting free throws has absolutely nothing to do with psychology. Uh, well, it, it does, but it has nothing to do with Psych 101 final exam. So that's a low validity. That's almost zero validity, but high reliability. Um, now, if I were to give you a 10-question exam in Psych 101, and I had a test bank of 100 multiple choice questions from all 18 chapters of the book. And you had 10 questions that were randomly picked from that, uh, that what would that be, 1800 question test bank. Would that be valid? All in all, yes, because I'm asking you questions from Psych 101. Is it reliable? Probably not, because I might give you uh, a randomized question, number of questions, and you might get them all because they all came from a chapter you studied, or um, they were all very simple questions. And the next time I, I randomly, the computer spits out 10 questions, you have no idea because you missed that week or something. Um, that'd be highly valid, but not very reliable. So when, when we're looking at information in research, we want it to be highly valid and highly reliable. That is the, the key to good research. Um, so going back to S data, um, it, it's your access to internal things. S data, again, being subjective, it's, it's how you experience, how you see things. It's based on you know huge amounts of data. Something that back in the 50s and 60s uh, would it would be very problematic because people had to uh, aggregate that data and do statistical analysis by hand. Today we have applications where um, that data can be uh, computed instantly. There's free things out there like SurveyMonkey that you can do thousands upon thousands of, uh, of, of surveys and, and collect data, and it will do the statistical analysis for you like that. Um, you still need to understand what that means, but it, it's awesome that we can actually do that. Um, we can look at uh, something called causal force, um, and that is the, uh, the efficacy or the effectiveness or the truth in a subjective manner of expectations and their self-verification. And it's usually very simple. Yes, no, this is me. What is my age type of things? Very easy data. The disadvantage is just like when we talked in Psych 101 or if you've done research, uh, you know, maybe people won't tell you the real information. Maybe they'll be, um, th they're not apt to tell you what they're really thinking. Um, you know, I, I teach human sexuality and, um, you know, that was the Kinsey report. Um, it was very good because he had a very uh, down to earth way of asking people questions they wouldn't normally answer. But if I were to try to do research in my human sexuality class and I were to say, hey, guys, you're going to meet with me one on one for 10 minutes and I'm going to ask for your sexual history. Um, there's a possibility that I might get some false data. And so um, maybe, uh, you know, people can't tell you the fish and water effect. Um, I, I find this to be something that we, we, we tend to forget about in most psychological research. If you were to ask a fish, you know, what is it like being in water? They're not going to be able to tell you because that's all they know. I mean, it's, it's, it's only in the absence of water that they can tell you what it's like not to be in water, but it, it would be like, what is it, what is it like to have oxygen coursing through the blood in your veins? I don't know. Uh, it, it is what it is. Um, there's also oftentimes a lack of insight because 
you don't look at your own motivations very often. You just kind of take things at face value. And sometimes it's just too simple. Sometimes the data just comes out way too simple and it's oversimplified and it's extrapolated uh, to, you know, this is about me, but it could extrapolate to all males or all uh, Caucasians or all college educated individuals or all people with uh, bad hair or all people wearing blue shirts. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, sometimes we just over extrapolate the data. So informant report data is, uh, is something that is used quite frequently because there's really not specific training. Um, it's based on observing people in whatever context they know them from, okay? So if, if I wanted to do informant report data, I could do it on college students at Ivy Tech because I can observe people in the context that I know them. Um, I wouldn't want to go outside of the context that I'm familiar with them. So I wouldn't want to go out and see what my students are doing uh, at, uh, you know, when they're out on the weekend because that's not really where I know them from and it's going to be skewed data. Um, the advantage is that uh, you're going to see a lot of different behaviors in many situations and you can get judgments from multiple informants. So I could have three people watching and we can kind of cross reference what, what we each saw. Um, and it's based on real world observations. Um, we also can look at the same things that we saw in S data, ca uh, causal force, definitional truth, and it's based on common sense. So um, because I know you're sitting in a college uh, classroom and I'm observing you, I know that you're going to be acting different than you would on the weekend or at your work or out with friends or wherever it might be. I'm going to take context into consideration. The disadvantage is I'm not getting much behavioral information other than what I'm observing. So I don't, I'm not asking you why you're acting the way you are. I'm just taking in, this is the way it is. Um, and I'm going to be biased. I'm going, if I'm, if I'm sitting here and I'm observing the behavior of my students and they're all looking at me while I'm talking, my bias might be, holy cow, I am the greatest lecturer in the world. They are completely in, you know, in tune to me. They are completely in, engaged in what I'm talking about. And you know what? Maybe, maybe they're all staring at me because my fly is undone. Uh, but my bias is they're doing it because, and they're all smiling, they're all engaged, they're all looking at me. And it's something completely different. Or maybe I wrote something on the board uh, that's completely off. And if anybody's been in one of my lectures, uh, I will sometimes say something or write something on the board and just keep on going and not realize that I've said something uh, that is slightly off of what I meant to say. And so my bias is, oh, everybody's engaging with me. Actually, they're trying to figure out what the heck I'm talking about. So uh, there's going to be a disadvantage there. Okay. So what are some uh, source influences on data? Um, what are the aspects of personality that people are likely or unlikely to accurately and honestly report about themselves? Um, you know, I think that you can all come up with the answer to this. Um, we're we're going to be, uh, we're always going to be skewing towards positives. Um, unless with something fundamental about ourselves that we really believe about, our, about ourselves. What influences your best friends, coworkers, and mother's impression of you? Um, you know, think about it. What, you know, what is it that you put out there um, that's gonna influence them? And what is it about them that's going to uh, influence you? So things to think about with the data. Life outcomes data or L data is obtained from archival records or self-report. Um, this L data comes from places like Facebook. If you want to do a personality assessment of somebody based on Facebook, this would be L data. Um, this is archival evidence. This is the residue of personality. And you got to be really careful because I know some of you probably put things on Facebook and Twitter and whatever it is that's uh, popular nowadays um, that may be putting out a personality that isn't necessarily who you are. It's kind of who you want to be, but that's still valid because it's saying who you want to be in a perfect situation. And that's part of your personality. It's who you strive to be. The advantages is objective and verifiable. That Facebook page, unless you change it, is going to be the same no matter what. Uh, it, it has intrinsic importance and it has psychological relevance. Uh, there is a disadvantage of um, that. There's going back to the fact that you can have an agenda. Uh, you can be hiding parts of your personality. Um, that is going to be something that you have to be very mindful of when you're looking at L data. Behavioral data, this is the most visible indication of an individual's personality because it's what they're doing. Behavioral data is what we do objectively. 
okay? It is, this is B data, and it's based upon a diary or sampling of what you're doing. Now, a lot of you know that I work um, outside of college. I work with individuals with developmental disabilities and psychiatric issues, and I am primarily looking at B data. I'm looking at what they are doing, um, and what I'm doing is... Um, ABC documenting, which is antecedent, what happened before, B, what is the behavior, C, what is the consequence or what happened because of it. Um, this is completely objective. Uh, when, I'm having, when I am documenting this or when I'm having somebody else observe one of my individuals that I work with, I want to know what happened before, what happened during, uh, what was the behavior that we're looking at, and what is the consequence, because I want it to be as objective as possible. I don't want you know, I think that they were feeling bad, so they yelled at me, and that caused me to walk away. Well, you thinking that they are, they're feeling bad or they're in a bad mood doesn't help me. The evidence would be um, individual was scowling and pacing, and when I walked up to them, boom, then they started yelling at me. That's B data. It's not interpretive. It's not subjective. It's completely objective. It's realistic disadvantages. It's really difficult because of the reliability, the inner rater reliability factor. Um, the people that I work with tend to have staff. They tend to have uh, parents or family. They tend to have, uh, they go to day programs or they go to work. And my goal to get valid data so that I can interpret it is that everybody is completely objective and they all define the behavior the same way. You have to have incredibly good what we call operational definitions of behaviors. Um, if I want somebody to say um, verbal aggression is a very common behavior with individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, unfortunately, it's one of the ones that is most misinterpreted because if I'm looking at behavioral data and somebody says that they were verbally aggressive, well, what did they do? Um, they, uh, they, they told me to shut the hell up, okay? According to my definition of this individual, uh, verbal aggression, that doesn't fit the definition of verbal aggression. Um, that may be a social skill deficit, that may be an inappropriate comment, but verbal aggression needs to be um, shut the hell up or I'm going to kick the crap out of you. Boom. That's verbal aggression. It's I'm, I'm trying to, to accomplish something because uh, it, it has a, a specific function. It has a specific thing that it's trying to do. If I were to, if I had a student come up to me while I'm doing this lecture and they were standing there going, excuse me, excuse me. And I look at them and I say, you know, what the heck do you want? That's not verbal aggression. That's me asking and can be interpreted. If I were to say, if you don't leave me alone, I'm going to fail you. That's a be, that is something that's aggressive in nature. That's verbal aggression because there's a consequence to what I'm saying. So uh, B data is very valid if it's done and, and interpreted correctly. Laboratory B data is where we just set up an artificial environment. So it's not a naturalistic observation. It's a laboratory. So we don't need to go through each of these steps individually. Um, basically, in a laboratory, we're setting up the environment and maybe putting in an antecedent that uh, we want to see what happens. Uh, we do this a lot, again, in behavioral um, consultation, behavior modification, because if we just sit around and wait for the antecedent that's going to cause something, uh, and we may be waiting for a while. We may, be, we may be wasting a lot of time. So, for example, I have an individual that I work with. He has autism. He has very classic autism. And one of the behaviors that has started in the last year is he loves pop. He loves soda. Um, and so he will oftentimes go to the trash can if he sees somebody throw away a can of pop and he'll go and he'll you know, get the last couple drops out of that. And we don't want him going through the trash and getting soda. So uh, we've set up some proactive things like putting a lid over it and having staff be vigilant. If he starts to walk over there, they redirect him. Um, but if we just waited to see what some of these uh, interventions might be or what would happen, we might be waiting for a while. So what we might do is create um, a, a pseudo laboratory where I might walk in with a can and just set it down in the trash can and then I watch what happened. Is it natural? No, but the laboratory is mimicking what the natural environment would be. So we can actually create this environment and say this is what would normally happen and this is what actually comes out. Okay. Uh, good thing about behavioral data is, or B data, is that uh, we can make a whole bunch of different contexts in the lab. We can create these worlds. Um, sometimes it can be pretty difficult and expensive, and sometimes we can't extrapolate out because, you know, me putting that can in there, it, you know, somebody may look at that and say, 
you know, this seems like a setup. Um, I always use the example in Psych 101 of the natural versus laboratory observation. If I were to want to know how long students will stay if the professor doesn't show up, uh, you know, class begins at one o'clock and it's 1.15 and the professor hasn't shown up. In a natural observation, when I'm looking at B data, I would want to figure out a way where I could see what time everybody leaves, how they behave, um, without them thinking that it's uh, it's a laboratory. So uh, I might have a confederate come in and, and, and do the documentation for me because I, I don't want to be influencing it. Um, in a laboratory, uh, you know, it's I'm going to try to set up the environment. But unfortunately, in a psychology class, because people after we do this, they kind of always are expecting there might be something going on. Um, it's always going to be somewhat of a laboratory because they're going to be looking for, you know, hey, what's the trick here? What's going on? Um, and then there's mixed types of data. And this is kind of real world. Um, it doesn't fit into one category. Uh, and it's, there's a wide range. So we could have uh, behavioral S data. We could have self-reporting behavioral data. We can have um, naturalistic observations that uh, you'd have a multitude of different types of data coming in. Um, and, and we're not going to go through each iteration because, you know, they can, it could get to the ridiculous uh, types of mixed data. But just know that each of these can be mixed together. Okay, so we've already talked about reliability. Um, what happens when there's poor reliability? Well, we get into this thing called measurement error, error um, or error variance. And this can be uh, whether or not uh, the different raters are uh, measuring the same way, okay? Um, then some of the factors that are going to undermine reliability is um, low precision of the measurement. You know, we think about measurements in the hard sciences with like rulers and scales. Well, think about if I were to tell you to pull out a sheet of paper and draw a ruler on this piece of paper. And then I want you to measure some things, very, very precise things like, um, uh, you know, I give you a couple of uh, items to measure and they're all uh, within a couple millimeters of each other. And you're using your own hand-drawn ruler. Um, your, your tool is going to give you low precision, excuse me, low precision because you've got a bad tool. So um, you also have to be looking at what's going on with the individual, the state of the participant, the state of the experimenter, the environment, all these things are going to change, especially B data. Uh, it's going to change uh, how people act and how people interpret things. Uh, so there are some times where we try to enhance reliability, but we have to be really careful with that because uh, oftentimes we enhance reliability and we skew the data, we skew the results to the results that we want or the ones that we think should be happening. So if I think that a particular behavior um, is going to happen uh, and I want to re enhance reliability in my observation, I may skew the environment. Uh, so going back to my example of uh, the my young uh, gentleman who drinks pop out of the trash, I may intentionally walk in front of him drinking and then set the pop can in the trash, but kind of set it down very slowly, making sure that he sees me, setting it up on top so it's easily accessible. Um, that's going to enhance the reliability that he's going to go over there and seek it out, but that's not the way that it happens in normal situations. Um, aggregation. Uh, this is uh, allowing random influences to cancel each other out. And so uh, this is one of those things where we want to be very careful when we're trying to enhance reliability that we're, we're being mindful of aggregation. Um, validity. Validity, once again, is testing what it is we're supposed to be testing, um, invokes the idea of the ultimate truth, okay? Um, it's difficult to really say because it's, it is, it's supposed to be objective, but it is somewhat subjective. Um, what we're looking at primarily is construct validity, uh, gathering as many measurements as possible and looking for ones that hang out. Um, that's a good way of looking at things, but also can be problematic because you, you may disregard things that don't match your hypothesis. Um, generalizability. Uh, this is the idea of I'm getting observations from three or four people and I can generalize, generalize that out to all people. Um, it, this is like, this is where a lot of biases come from. And unfortunately, this is where a lot of stereotypes and, and, and racist connotations come from. Um, you know, if you have lived a sheltered life and you go to, um, you know, you go to a, a, a a city and you meet some people from cultures you've never met before and they're not nice to you, um, you're going to generalize that to all people that kind of match up with that. Um, so we have to be very careful with generalizability, but also in research, it has to be generalizable or else we're just getting information about that one individual.
So finally, we're going to get into the review aspect. Um, you know, in 101, I teach normally there are four basic types of research. There are three correlational research, which are uh, case studies, surveys, uh, and uh, observations, which are broken down into natural and obser uh, natural and uh, laboratory. And then we have the causation-based research, which is experimental. Case uh, method or case study is where you look at a small grouping of usually historical things and seeing if you can yield an explanation from it. Um, it's good for uh, understanding an individual. However, generalizability is not always perfect. So in a case study, um, you may want to study the sleeping patterns of serial killers. Um, and so you, you, you do some uh, research and you find data or you interview serial killers and um, you can get that information, uh, but you don't know if you get data that matches and you only pulled six serial killers, because that's all you could get to, you don't know if that's just generalizable to um, serial killers that have been caught. Maybe people who don't get caught have different different patterns. You have no control because you're only using data of people that you, uh, you've you been able to gain access to. So uh, it, it, sometimes it's as good as we can get, but it's not always perfect. The experimental method, again, this should be review. So I'm going to go over it very quickly. Uh, if you need more, um, you can access uh, for the textbook or you can go in and look at experimental methods. There's all types of uh, uh, lectures on that. Uh, the, and we can, we can discuss that. If you're in a uh, one-on-one -on -one class with me, we can, um, we can discuss this at length. But basically, research is where you take the independent variable and the dependent variable and uh, you look to see differing levels of the independent variable measuring uh, the average behavior of the dependent variable that results from uh, each group, okay? So what you're doing is you're holding all things equal. You're changing one variable between the control group and the experimental group. So if I wanted to see um, the impact of lighting versus low lighting, in my psychology classes. What I would do is I would randomly select, um, you know, a couple of my classes to have low lighting where I turn off all the lights and do my lecture. And then I have high lighting in, uh, you know, brighter lighting in another randomly selected couple. And I look at the comparison because the only thing that should be different is uh, the lighting scheme. Now, uh, that would mean that I would have to teach exactly the same. I'd have to have the same questions be asked. I'd have to have the same, you know, I have to randomize the people who come into the class. It'd be very difficult. But just for the simplicity, I'm only changing those two variables, that, that one variable, the lighting, okay? Um, so uh, when we're looking at the experimental method, experimental method um, we can look at leaders versus leaders assistance, rank list of items needed to survive in a lifeboat on the open sea and measure interpersonal sensitivity. So that's that's a, a very loose um, one that the textbook puts forth for an experimental method. And what we're looking for here is uh, whether there's a statistical um, uh, a valid res uh, response from the um, data that is given, okay? And so when we look at that, we're, we can say that one thing possibly causes the other, but also we can also just see that there's a correlation. Correlation is how one thing affects the other. And so if we're, if we're simply looking at, uh, you know, maybe hours slept and during the week of finals and your finals grade, we may see that there's a correlation that people who get eight hours of sleep um, averaged a 90, people who got four hours of sleep averaged a 70, people who got six hours of sleep averaged a 79. And we can see that there's a pretty decent correlation between hours slept and your psychology grade on your final. However, we wouldn't say that sleeping more caused you to get a better grade. It's one component, but, all, but what we can say is um, that sleeping correlates with getting a better grade on a test, okay? Are there other factors? Obviously, but we know that there, there could be a correlation there, okay? Um, when we compare experimental and correlational research, uh, both of them are looking at relationships. Um, we can uh, we can do statistics with both of them. We can look for reliability and validity. Um, the experimental method manipulates what we think is the cause and the correlation method measures it, okay? So if I think that sleep is going to impact 
uh, the final exam grade. Uh, I'm gonna let every, I'm gonna randomly select people, and I'm only gonna let one group sleep four hours and one one group sleep eight hours, and then I'll measure it. And everything else will have to be kept easy or kept the same. Correlational method is gonna be kind of the data that comes from that to say yes that there is this correlation between the two. Um, again, this this should be reviewed from Psych 101. Please, if you learn nothing from of the scientific method. Please remember that experiments are the only type of research that can show causality. Okay, uh, it's because you are you're keeping everything else the same, and you're changing one thing. So if I had a group of students who um, all weighed exactly the same, let's say that I had a group of let's just create let's do Frank let's Frankenstein this thing. I have a group of a hundred students, all of which are six foot female that weigh 150 pounds, and I want to see if um, adding one hour of exercise will decrease their weight uh, down to, you know, will decrease their, their body mass index. Um, so I feed them exactly the same. I, let, I make them sleep exactly the same. I, you know, I, I'm completely in control of them. And uh, one group exercises for an hour while the other group sits and watches television for an hour. That's the only difference in their daily life. And I do this for a month. If at the end, the group that, uh, that that was exercising each way between 142 and 146, while the other group remains at 150, I can say that that exercise caused it because that's the only variable that changed. But we know in real life, that's not going to happen. I may have some people who exercise who actually end up gaining weight, or I might have some of the people who sit on the couch lose weight. There's all these human variables going on. So uh, it, it becomes very difficult to show causation in the social sciences. That's why we have a lot of correlational research that we look at. Um, experiments are not always better because sometimes you're trying to prove one factor when it's actually something else. And so if you look at correlational research, it'll oftentimes point you to where you should be going rather than where you think you should be going. Okay, so we'll end up with these final clicker questions. Data, remember data is both the singular and plural. There's your English lesson for the day. Uh, data are clues to personality, always ambiguous. How researchers can see personality. Well, and when we look at these, we always wanna be careful with always, okay? Um, but in this case, how researchers can see personality, that is that is true. Clues to personality, that is also true. Um, and so uh, this always is one of the times where, you know, data is, data is always ambiguous, but the way that we interpret it um, may bring some order to it. So in this case, I'm gonna say that, you know, it, the data is ambiguous, but the interpretation isn't. So all of these things do match up. If you are interested in what a person does rather than what a person says about himself, then you are collecting Well, for the most part here, uh, you know, we could argue back and forth about some of these, but the, the best answer here, in my opinion, is B data. Uh, B data is behavioral data. That is what a person does. It is objective. Anybody can look at it. Um, S data is going to give us more about what they say about themselves. It's more subjective. Uh, so it's the B data is what is going to be um, what a person does. B behavioral. What does it mean to say that S data have causal force? Okay, so we can we can really take A out of the equation because it's not a cause. S data doesn't cause personality. What people think about themselves influences how they behave. How people behave is caused by what others think of them. People's environment cause their self-perceptions. Well, B and C really kind of contradict each other. Um, what people think about themselves influences how they behave. Um, how people behave is caused by what other people think of them. So really, if you're just using uh, basic test taking skills, the best answer here is probably people's environments cause their self-perception. But if we really wanna go back and find and make sure of that, we always just go back here in the clicker and we look up S data and we see what S data is all about. High face validity based upon large amounts of information 
uh, access to thoughts, it's definitional truth, uh, it's causal force, simple and easy. Many people won't tell you, many people can't, too simple and too easy. So we go back and maybe we reinterpret our question. Maybe we should go to the correct slide. And so S data still doesn't cause. What people think about themselves influences how they behave. That one is a little bit more true after we look at the if we look at the slides. So, you know, I think D has a component to it, but B probably is the strongest answer here. And again, with any of these questions, you know, there's the right answer, and then there's answers that we can kind of interpret. Uh, and so you may have come up with a different answer, and it's all about how you can reinforce that answer, how you can uh, how you can justify your statement. It's not necessarily being right. It's about being able to understand uh, what's going on in these questions. Okay, so that is all we have for research. Uh, I hope everybody uh, stuck with me till the end. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me, bmitchell at ivytech.edu, and uh, we will be getting into section three in our next lecture. So uh, until then, um, hopefully everybody has a great week.